Time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therat is here with his analysis of all those big announcements from Apple yesterday. And, of course, some Windows news, too. It's all coming up next with Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott. Episode 198, recorded March 3rd, 2011. Smart. Very smart. Windows Weekly is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. If you're in tech support, solve problems fast with the leader in remote support software. Go to Assist Express for a free 30-day trial. Visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free 14-day trial, go to squarespace.com slash windows. And by audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. It's time for Windows! Weekly. Paul Therott is here, the man in charge of the super site for Windows, winsupersite.com, to talk about the latest from Microsoft. He's also the author of many great books. Let's just reach back and see which one of them I have. <laughs> oh, I have a great many. He only writes thick books, the Windows Vista Secrets. Look how thick that is. But it pales compared to one of his earlier books, the Delphi 3 Super Bible. And, of course, actually they're getting thinner because there's the Windows Phone Secrets. It's, it's actually a manageable <laughs> I think that Windows 7 Secrets might be the biggest one. Windows 7 Secrets is great. And by the way, yeah. must have if you have Windows 7. <laughs> Somebody said it sounded like I pulled something reaching back there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, oh, that's enough exercise these for this are, week. These are heavy. If you bench pressed these, I think you'd be in pretty good shape. A little, little, little tricep action there. Look at that. Oh, that's good. But there was a time when computer... I remember when I was even writing computer books where the conventional wisdom is the thicker the better. You, they sell better if they're thicker. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's true anymore, to be honest. Oh, I'm, sh I'm sure it's not. Nobody wants a thick book. And since people buy them on uh, Kindle, you can get all your books on the Kindle. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if you've been paying attention lately, but nobody wants a book, period. So, <laughs> Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I have noticed that. So, uh, how are you today? I am well. Good. You've, I am, you look uh, thinner every time I see you. You're, just, <laughs> I you're hope wasting so. away. I'm slightly, yeah. I'm never going to waste away. I've got... I hate this camera. Why did I buy this? <laughs> what are you using there that you hate so damn much? It's a Microsoft LifeCam HD oh, thing. Yeah. Jiggy. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. It's, it doesn't. Um, I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the USB three cameras. Yeah. And I know there's some already. I think because with all that bandwidth, you should be able to get some good images. I'm gonna do something different in here. I gotta. I gotta change this whole thing up. <laughs> <laughs> It's so what happens. You lose some weight, you look to change your life. I just, yeah. I'm tired of this place. <laughs> this is, I love Paul. <laughs> Me too. You know what I think I'm going to do, Paul? I think I'm going to rent a 10,000 square foot facility, spend half yeah, a yeah. million dollars, and we'll just move right over there. We're going to move right over there. What do you think? I think you should do it. I'm taking all this crap with me, though, all the stuff behind me. No, I understand. We built, in fact, it's uh, it's being stained right now to match this fine uh, brown, right, right, right. brown color. Uh, we built this. That's the kind of color you get with one of those magic markers that's <laughs> meant to replace defects in a piece of yeah. wood or something. Or if you use Grecian, Grecian Formula 16, it looks just yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Your hair it's will look man that. 16. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but we, we built it and we got it. It's, it, 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 it's going to be beautiful. Yeah. It's it's uh, somebody said it's like putting the Oval Office in a uh, in a uh, warehouse. It's exactly <laughs> what it is. Huh. Exactly what it is. Neat, neat. So um, this is an interest. Now, Paul, I got a I, disclaimer here. Yes, sir. People think that I, as a Macintosh fan, yes. By the way, my credentials as a Macintosh fan have been tarnished lately. People think. I should get off Mac break with since I'm such a Windows fan. Then I get an email right after it says, you should get off Windows Weekly since you're such a Mac fan. But people think I set the agenda for this podcast. Will you set them straight? You set the agenda, my friend. This is your show. I do. Yeah, so there's a lot of Apple stuff in here today, but 
Fear not. <laughs> it is not. Uh, <laughs> It's not presaging. It's the not future. like an Apple show. It's, no. it's Apple stuff in the context of Windows. Good. Case so, in point. Yes. Our first topic. OS X Lion. <laughs> Lion, for those of you <laughs> unclear of that particular <laughs> not, cat sound. Not, not OS X. Uh, Puma. Not, not Cheetah. <laughs> not Bobcat. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Apple released a developer preview of the next version of Mac OS X last week. Getting a lot of attention. And, uh, yeah, and the reason I'm, in, well, I'm interested in it from a, a kind of a competitive standpoint, I suppose. Um, but I also, I also see, see some things in there that I think have analogs in the next version of Windows. And then also some things that Microsoft isn't necessarily doing that I think maybe they should be doing. Ah. You know, and I think it's interesting from that standpoint. Uh, we know a lot more about the next version of Mac OS X than we do about the next version of Windows. Oh, we do. Um, so, oh, we do. Yeah, yeah, especially with this release. So it was interesting to me. I mean, I, I, I've said this before, and I just want to reiterate this in case anyone uh, thinks this is going to degenerate into some kind of an Apple accolade type of thing. I, I like their hardware and all that. I, I've never been a big fan of Mac OS X. And I do think that this version, Lion, is nicer. But I've always found it to be a very Spartan uh, kind of uninteresting OS. And I do, I really do prefer Windows 7 to Mac OS X. Um, that said, I, I think that largely because of their experience with iOS and the devices that Apple's been making, the company has brought back some interesting ideas uh, to OS X. And I think it's the type of thing that Microsoft should be looking at doing for Windows 8 as well. Such as... Such as, well, for example, one of the you know, and one of the themes I think and, uh, that I would have mentioned over the years here on the podcast was this need for simplicity. And I've mm. I've often raised the issue of, at some point, you have this system that becomes so bloated and convoluted because of all the stuff that's been added to it over time that it's you really you you can't tax simplicity onto something with with any amount of success. You know, sometimes you have to start over, and you have to start over with something that is designed to be simple from the get-go. And I think that the biggest success of products like the iPad, for example, is that when Apple looked at it, perhaps just by virtue of what they had been doing at the time and what had been successful with them or whatever, they didn't take the Microsoft approach, which was to make Windows fit into everything. They took a different approach, which was we have this new thing, let's use that. So they, they upsized something small rather than downsizing something big. And I think that that was... I, well, I think it's, not, I don't think, it's not just my opinion. I think it's obviously true that they did the right thing. You well, know, the, the I think it wouldn't, small or big is not the issue, but they made an operating system that was designed for that particular device. Right, rather than saying, oh, look, people are buying these kind of devices now. Let's take this thing we already have, which is humongous, right. and we'll squeeze it down into that device. I think it's all about UI, though, don't you? I think it's largely about but UI. You think I, simplicity, I, I, too. But it's it's simplicity, and it's also what you just said, actually, that the entire platform has been designed for this thing from the right. get-go, right. you know, and I think that's what makes sense. I think the big reason the tablet PC never really took off was that it was just, let's keep milking this cash cow and push it into new form factors. Right. And it doesn't, right. it doesn't always make sense. You know, I think that they made that mistake with Media Center where they should have gone with a device. Maybe they were ahead of, you know, ahead of the schedule a little bit there. And same thing with tablet PC, you know, uh, the iPad, I think, has proven that there is a market for these devices when they're done right and that the tablet PC wasn't done right. So, um, you know, I don't necessarily agree with the style, but in, in OS X Lion, there is this, uh, I think it's called Launchpad. Is right. that the right name? I think so, yeah. And it an is expert, an IO... Was that? I'm not an expert. I really haven't played You're not an expert. That's no. right. I forgot. You, you barely pay I hate, attention. I hate Apple yeah. with so, a passion. Yeah. Haven't you been reading you heard the, that. the tabloids? Yeah. Leo hates Apple.com. Yeah. Steve and I broke up. Yeah. <laughs> well... You know, people, uh, I'm sorry, I, I would say Apple on uh, on the device side has these uh, screens of icons that they use, you know, grid of icons that they use for launching apps. So they bring that to uh, Lion. Now, Apple actually had a UI like that years and years ago, right? Um, I think it was called At Ease. Right. And it was right. essentially the same thing, a grid of icons, you know, and it didn't really go very far. But I don't it think it's a good UI. It doesn't UI. make sense, I think, on the uh, desktop. Yeah, probably not. Because uh, you have more but, real estate. You don't need... 
Yeah. I, but I think the thing, I think where it makes a little bit of sense, and I, and I don't mean this UI specifically, I, th I think I'm talking more about the concept behind it, which is just a simpler way of doing things. One of the, uh, you know, we did that signature PC uh, thing. Actually, you weren't, you weren't there when the guy was here, but I did the um, uh, focus groups at Microsoft we, and, and in, just in talking with Microsoft about... Oh, yeah, I didn't hear about that. So that was what it was about? Well, it, it was one of the aspects of it was you, you look at a PC, you think of, you, you, there's a history that everyone right. brings to their interactions with things, you know. So some people look at a PC desktop which is crowded with icons. And then they have this taskbar that's crowded with icons. Right. And then they have a, a start menu that's crowded with icons. And some people see clutter there and some other people see opportunity, you know, that this computer has lots of stuff on it. So that's valuable to me. And it's hard when, when you have two types of customers buying the same product. How do you please both of those people, mm -hmm. you know? Um, on Mac OS X, there's a slightly different interaction there where you have an applications folder um, you have this thing that kind of springs out of the dock now where you can see your apps and all that. And, and I think that this Launchpad screen essentially puts that up on the desktop. It's not necessarily every single application, but it's most of them, if you will. You know, it, it's, um, it's a simplified view of that. I think the advantage on the Microsoft side is that in Windows Phone 7, they have what I think is a, a better way of doing things. It's a better UI, and it's something that would make a lot of sense on a tablet-type device. And... There are rumors, and I've heard from some of my sources, that Microsoft is working to put this Windows Phone style UI in Windows in a, 8. In a desktop? In a, well, not a it, tablet. Would be, it would be optional in a desktop. But the, you know, remember, Windows 8 is going to be an OS that's going to be squeezed into everything from a pocket watch all the way up to a server. Uh, so Again, with the maybe not the best optimal. I, I, I happen to disagree with this strategy, but you know that doesn't matter. I'm just saying that's what's going to happen. So. Yeah. Uh, it could be in phones. It could be. It will. You know, will be in phones. I should say. It will be in tablets. It will be in traditional laptops, of course. Traditional desktops and all that kind of stuff. Now, on the higher end machines, the the types of PCs that we think of today as PCs, that option, that UI will be optional, just like Launchpad is on an OS X uh, Lion. Um, on lower end devices, and and maybe lower end isn't the right term, but smaller devices, smaller form factors, that screen that type of UI will be the default. And I th actually think that does make a lot of sense. And it's, I don't think Apple is ever going to make an iPad type device that runs OS X. Why would they? But Microsoft being Microsoft, <laughs> they are essentially going to do that or their partners will do that in the PC space. So it's interesting to me that they have this option where you could have either UI or both UIs, you know, you can choose between them and it would work across a range of devices. So that's interesting. So it's kind of the same thing that Apple's doing. It's just that the UIs are different. But the point is they're bringing across a simpler application discovery and updating UI from a device and they're bringing it to the full PC experience. I think it's a good idea. I, I Again, I disagree with the way Apple's doing it. Um, I just agree with the, it's, it's Microsoft. I disagree with the way both of them are doing it. Actually. They all but, suck. Yeah, you know the other thing, of course, and we already had this on the Mac side was the uh, the marketplace, the App Store. We know that Microsoft is going to bring Windows Marketplace to to Windows. They have to. Uh, There's a new app model coming and all that. And I think that that's something too that um, you know we've talked about this in the past. You have a modern platform. You know, part of the deal is you have this checklist, you know, of items you have to have. One of them is a store. You have to have an online store. And uh, Windows needs one. It's overdue. You know, I think Apple did the right thing by shipping their store early before the next version of the OS as sort of a beta that everyone could get and smart. I think Microsoft is moving, you know, very slowly there. And then there's other stuff, you know, just looking at OS 10 again, I don't use it every single day because like you, I, I hate it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but looking at it again, you know, with semi-fresh eyes, um, I see some things in there that I really like that I don't think are going to happen on the Windows side, you know. Some of them are big and some are small. You know, one of the things I've been complaining about a lot with Windows over the years is the sheer number of product editions. Microsoft is, has jumped a shark, I think, with this kind of stuff. Apple's it's going ridiculous. the opposite way. Now, Windows, I mean, OS yeah. X Server will be built into all the copies. That's so awesome, you know. Yeah. And, and I want to be really clear. There's absolutely no way that Microsoft could ever do that. You know, the server product line they have is such a major part of their business. It's got to be something like 20% of their revenues. There's no way they're going to just give this up to give it away for free as part of Windows. I mean, that's not the way you know, life works on the Microsoft side. But I think Apple, because of the way their market is, 
is able to do something like that. And Microsoft, conversely, because of the way their market is, can't. But that is a really neat thing that Apple can do. I, I, because Microsoft can't go that far, I wish they would l at least meet them part way and just say, look, you know, one for home, one for business. You know, is that too much to ask? You know, make it simple. It's really, it's, there's just too much stuff. Uh, it's too complicated figuring out all the different uh, choices you have. And you really do have a lot of choices there. It's, it's, it's too much. The, the other thing that, um, that I think is a big issue that OS X does very well, even though on the back end it's very similar to the way Windows works, is it handles high-resolution displays and high DPI in a way that is far more attractive, I think, than on Windows. And by that I mean you have these UI elements that you can stretch out to bigger sizes, and they still look good. Uh, Apple does a really nice job with that. And on the Windows side, not so much. And I, I honestly, part, I'd say at least 50% of it is simply that the base images that Apple's working with just happen to be bigger, probably twice as big um, as the images, say, for icons or whatever the on-screen elements are that Microsoft uses. The other 50% is something I can't quite put my finger on. I've always felt that text rendering on OS X was excellent, you know, very... Um, they've done a very nice job. You know, Apple, by virtue of the fact that they did hardware acceleration and they did transparency type effects years before Microsoft did it in Windows, has had that time of experience to make that look better. You know, they've done a good job. I remember when uh, OS X first came out, you know, the menus would pop down and you could really see below them and it was too much, you know, uh, and they cleaned that up over time. And I think this is something Microsoft is, it's just a maturity issue they'll get there. But obviously the future of this stuff is in true resolution independence, and you know, via vector graphics, probably something that's not bitmap based, which is essentially what you see today in both OS X and, and in Windows. And uh, that's it's it's not that OS X is doing something superior technologically per se, although maybe that is part of it. It's just that for what even within the confines of the way that OS X is doing this, i.e., in a very similar way to Windows, it still manages to look better. And I think that um, aesthetically. This is a very important thing for people, you know, because when you look at a screen side by side, you know, Windows and the Mac, if the Mac screen has much nicer looking text and a better presentation, you know, that's something that people will notice and respond to, you know, and I think that Windows needs to catch up in that way. You know, let me ask you about this, uh, this full screen mode. Yeah, uh, I I'm kind of I have mixed feelings about this. It feels like they want to turn a, a Mac into a uh, into an iPad. Uh, and maybe that's it. Do you so, think when that's an appropriate thing for Windows, a full screen mode? Well, Windows has full screen. See, I mean, like, there's no there's no menus or I mean, just the it takes right. it's it's an iPad basically. Right. I think that for eighty to ninety percent of people out there, that that kind of app actually is all they need. You know, um, certainly I look at some writers uh, actually. Uh, you know, some word processors have that mode. So because yeah, writers get yeah, distracted. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I, sure, sure. I, I played with that kind of stuff myself. I mean, I don't actually do that, but... Yes, well, there's no I, room for Call of Duty. You can't... <laughs> well, that's why you have an Xbox. You know, you have two <laughs> screens. But, well, no, I mean, when you, I think when you take power users out of the, the mix and then uh, people who are really just power users who are... We have other right. names. We're the ones who bitch and moan, but re right. you're talking about real people. Yeah. I'm talking about real people. So, yeah. you know, in other words, you get rid of that at max 10%. Um, you know, for the rest of them, my parents, you know, my friends who are not into technology, uh, they're pretty much doing one thing at a time. Right. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Plus, it's, again, it's not necessarily discoverable, but there are gestures built into OS X where you can flip between these full screen experiences pretty seamlessly. I would say actually much more seamlessly than you can on, say, uh, the iPad. And that's very powerful, actually, right? Because not only are you literally running more than one app, but you have a nice way to switch between them. So I think there's some room in there. I, I, it's just that, you know, in that famous, uh, now famous truck versus car discussion that Steve Jobs started, you know, the Mac, of course, becomes a truck. It, it doesn't go away, but it becomes less, you know, a, a smaller piece of the pie. And um, I think that's true on both sides, you know, PC and Mac, too. So I think these simpler UIs, it's important to experiment with them and see what people respond to. It may work out that some of this stuff just doesn't play well on, on the PC or Mac side because uh, just of the differences in the device types and so forth. But um, I, I, think, I think it's neat. You know, 
um, I go back and I rewatch a lot of these Apple keynote videos, and it's really interesting. You know, that back to the Mac event they had a few months ago, he talked about this sort of virtuous cycle, you know, and I, I think that's a really neat thing that they can do. Uh, it's cool that the learning doesn't just go one way, you know. Okay. I think it ultimately benefits everyone. Okay. You're so positive. <laughs> really? You're such I get a that. I, I get that all the time. Yeah. I get that all the time. It's yeah. good for us all. It's good for everyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, Typical I, I, you Wisconsin know, I, Democrat. The only thing I always want is that just, you know, make sure that I know we're only 10% or whatever, but the enthusiast power, the whole gall darn thing, you know, we're the ones who write the software, we're oh, the yeah, ones. But, uh, but, so make know, sure the, you don't uh, leave uh, us out completely. <laughs> I know what you're saying, and I, I, I guess I agree with that because obviously I fall into the same group. But, you know, this is like the people who love some up-and-coming band and then hate them when they become popular and oh, start writing pop songs. <laughs> that's you know, true, Well, too. no, it's the same thing, right? I mean, I, uh, for years, had to deal with these kind of Apple goons, you know, who couldn't stand any type of criticism against Apple. But as this stuff became more and more popular, a bigger and bigger percentage of the user base on that side is just normal people. They don't have the same religious affiliations right. with this company as, as as some of the more freakier people do. So, you know, the the conversation becomes more relaxed <laughs> over time. I mean, um, I I agree with you that you can't, you know, completely ignore uh, the people who got you there or or the power users, as we would well, say. Well, not just because they got you there. It's not like oh, you owe us anything. It's that if you want innovation to continue, I you yeah. know, to be honest. Well, I, I, well, I worry, you know, that, that these companies are going to sit. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I think it's great if it's more accessible. I don't know if that's really what they're going for. Um, hey, listen, some, some nerdy little guy was sitting in his uh, parents' basement and he invented the internet. Right. And this thing has been used to connect people and uh, enable communication. Yeah. He's been running and, it for, and, ever since. Many people don't know about Jason, but he's like, yeah, it's his well, thing. This is. This is a guy who has no communication skills at all. Right. So there's some I irony to this. Isn't, but, there, isn't it funny? You know, but that's the way life works. You know, uh, if, when things become very popular and become mainstream popular, you know, whether you're talking about Apple devices or Windows PCs or whatever it is, you know, when talk, we're not talking about technical people anymore. We're talking about just people. And uh, we've had conversations, I know, on the podcast where I've, I've uh, alluded to different friends who are, you know, I've got a friend who's uh, really into sports and it's been really, and not into computers, and it's been intriguing to watch him adopt over time computers and music programs. And then he wants iPod type devices and he wants to put them in his car. And he, now he wants a smartphone. And, uh, you know, they come along. They come along at a different speed maybe than a lot of the people who listen to this podcast because that's not their primary focus. Um, but at some point, these things hit the mainstream and they become important to, to normal people. And then, you know, things change. I mean, it's just the way it is. So... I don't know. It, it's tough because in the Windows world, we've always dealt with the notion of dual or even multiple interfaces, which means different ways to do the same thing. And it's so stupid in so many ways. But the point is, it serves such a, a diverse market that different people approach tasks in different ways. So whether you're talking about, you know, burning a DVD or uh, sharing a photo or whatever it is, you know, a technical person may want to do it one way. My grandmother might want to do it a different way. Right. They have all these ways. And in Windows, there's a million ways to do these things. Right. Um, you know, unfortunately, or just naturally, in the on the Apple side, as their stuff becomes more popular, um, you know, these are the same issues that uh, that company is going to have to deal with as well. I love these conversations, to be honest. I think they're great because uh, uh, most of the time, these kinds of philosophical conversations, if they happen at mm -hmm. Apple and Microsoft, happen behind closed doors. Um, sure. And everything, you know, at least uh, most tech uh, media and certainly all mainstream media just kind of takes it as a given and then says, well, but what do you think? As opposed to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What as, do you think? as opposed to, or will you buy it? As opposed to, I think the more interesting, deeper philosophical conversation that I presume that, you know, the designers are having in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in inside these companies. I, I'm amazed anything gets done, period, yeah. you know. Yeah, I'm also I'm also coming around to the notion. We'll talk about the iPad a little bit uh, toward the end here, but you know, revolutions don't happen very often, right? And then once the revolution happens, you don't do it again. 
<laughs> you know, so I, I'm, I tend to, because of the, the nature of my job and the way that I am, I want things to happen on a very fast basis. You know, I've complained about the speed at which Windows Phone is not moving in any way, shape or form or whatever it is. And, you know, the reality is you ha these companies have a responsibility all of a sudden. You know, it's one thing to sell a million units of anything. But once you start selling, you know, several or dozens of millions or, you know, tens of millions, twenties of millions, um, uh, you have a, it's a completely different responsibility. And it, it turns into a different conversation. You know, Windows kind of plods along because, you know, God, there's like a million, there's a billion people using Windows. You know, it's you called can't inertia. Really, yeah, you can't screw with it too much. Right. Um, I think the reason Apple is still interesting, actually, that's not fair. One, one of the reasons Apple is still interesting is because they're still so aggressive and are still so willing to kill stuff to move ahead. And it's just something Microsoft can't do. They just won't do it. It's just not in their DNA. Right. We've talked about that very, many times too. Yeah. Yeah. Very different companies. That's good. Let a thousand <laughs> flowers bloom. <laughs> yeah. Let a million baked goods oh, be baked. <laughs> Let a million so, buns be baked. <laughs> I guess to conclude, Leo, I would Please say... Do. I like MacBooks, but if I had one, I would put Windows 7 on it. Interesting. Why is that? Because I don't, I don't care for Mac OS X. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. There, I said it. Huh. That's hmm. interesting. You, yep. you apparently don't want any more listeners. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? You know, it's, so, it's a Windows podcast. Oh, wait a minute. That's, That's right. I thought this was Mac was, Week Weekly. Never that mind. That was exactly the right thing to say. <laughs> that was exactly the right thing to say. I was pandering <laughs> to my audience, even if it's true. <laughs> I like OS ten. I admit it. I admit it. I don't sure. know. Uh, but I like Windows 7. Uh, I just don't use it very much. But, I, but it's, it's very nice. <laughs> it's like the Dos Equis ad. You know, Leo, I do not use Linux. But if I did, I would use Ubuntu Linux. <laughs> what is he called? The world's greatest uh, lover or something? Yeah. I don't know. Yes. I love those ads. I do too. I They're great. Them. Hey, let's take a break. Come back with more Paul, Paul, Mathur Paul Matharat. Paul, Paul Matharat. Matharat is here. We're talking Windows, and uh, yes, we will have a uh, Windows 8 story, a Windows Phone 7 story, uh, and a lot more. Something new called Intune. Yeah, I was going to give out a phone number, but there's really no reason to call since we don't have a phone number. But I will give out this good advice to anyone who is in the support profession. Go to Assist Express. If you are in tech support, you know clients are looking to you for fast service, reliable service, and remote access really does help you. Remote service uh, is the best way to go. You don't have to walk them through stuff on a phone call. You don't have to fly out or even walk down the hall. We always knew when the, uh, at, uh, at Tech TV, we always knew when the IT department was coming because you'd hear the jingling of their keys on their belts from like 100 feet away. Jingle, jingle, jingle. Oh, here comes the IT guy. Jingle. You don't have to get up and jingle. Go to Assist allows you to access your clients' computers, fix the problem, and move on. In fact, uh, Frost and Sullivan, which uh, is a an industry analyst group that focuses on this sector, said Go to Assist is the worldwide market leader in remote support, the number one remote support solution worldwide because it's easy to use, it's affordable, it's secure. You don't have to have software pre-installed. You just tell your customer here, click this link. Literally a minute later, they're ready to go. And now that it's installed, you have access to their system even when they're not there. So you can instantly start supporting them online. Try it free for 30 days. That's really the best to come on. You don't have to listen to what I say. Try it. Go to assist.com slash windows. Please use that URL so that Paul gets all the credit he deserves. I'm going to start saying that in all the shows. Use the <laughs> special. Well, we, because. I was thinking, and maybe more than I deserve. More. Give Paul more credit than he deserves by using this special URL. Go to assist.com slash windows. Try it free for 30 days. Costs you nothing. And I think you'll find it very, very useful. Dr. Mom says the best come on is come upstairs and see my iPad too. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Hey, baby. Uh, hey, I've had baby. to, the dumbening. The dumbening. It is. Um, Microsoft did say, didn't they? I mean, I may be wrong on this, but I seem to remember uh, Microsoft was going to announce all these Windows tablets. Did they? I don't think so. What no. do you mean? 
I don't know. Explain yourself, sir. Explain myself. <laughs> well, it was kind of funny because watching uh, Steve Jobs uh, yesterday, yeah. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah. like, the other guys aren't ready. We got them beat. There's no competition. These guys suck. He wasn't even talking about Microsoft in that case. No, no, no. It was all Android. They are absolutely not part of the They're conversation. They're not even in the conversation. Yeah, a year, a year ago, uh, Steve Ballmer got up at the CES stage and claimed, you know, they'd have all kinds of That's responses. That's what I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, and they, I... I don't pay attention to the news, but I assume that's worked out great for Microsoft and they're probably <laughs> dominating in that market. But, yeah. So, you know, th this goes back to that problem we were talking about, that, you know, you've got this thing, Windows, that was designed, uh, well, has been evolved over many, many years. And, and you know, it, it's proven to be very versatile, no doubt about it. Um, I, I think there's this belief because of what happened with the network market that they could just do this again in every market. And actually, the reason the network, book market worked for Microsoft is that a netbook is a PC. Right. So uh, here's a laptop. Now here's a little laptop. You know, can you run the same thing on it? Yeah, it's just a little version of the same thing. It works. You know, it's no problem. Uh, but I think as you move to different form factors and different uh, usage models, um, that falls apart. And clearly that's what's happened uh, with Windows so far. So in my experience, I don't think that Windows, Windows 7 is fantastic. I love it. But I don't think it's the ideal interface for a tablet device. I just don't. Well, as we said earlier, I think it needs to be designed from the ground up for this. Yeah. So we'll see what they do with Windows 8. You know, Microsoft. Uh, that is an opportunity. I mean, that's yeah. the cycle they're on. Yes. Right. So Microsoft is developing Windows 8 right now. Obviously, they have stated uh, their intention to move it to the ARM platform, which will enable it to run on these smaller devices. Uh, we can call them, I think, iPad-like devices and also on phones. So that's coming. And we've talked before in the podcast about the basic schedule for Windows 8, which involves the thing shipping sometime in the middle of 2012. Uh, thus, there would be a public beta right at the beginning of 2012 or at the end of 2011. And uh, thus, there would be a private beta, a la Windows 7, sometime in the September, October timeframe, probably at a PDC uh, that will be occurring this year. So um, if you compare this, schedule to what happened with Windows 7, one of the interesting things you see is they did a tablet demo of the multi-touch features of Windows 7 in, I think it was May of that year. Let's say that must have been 2008. I'm getting the dates right. I think it was 2008. You're asking and, uh, me like I would I'm, I'm thinking I'm asking my brain. And I am responding. an expert. I follow closely the Windows <laughs> server market. Believe me. I know. No, no, this is the tablet market. Tablet. Whatever it is. So I'm following it all. I, I believe at the All Things D conference in, let's say, May or June of 20, 2008, that Microsoft did a demo of what was going to be the, you know, the Windows 7 multi-touch features. So that's interesting. So now there's a rumor from a pretty good source that there will be a similar Windows 8 tablet PC demo uh, by the end of the first half of this year. So it, it sort of makes sense, you know, based on what happened with Windows 7, that that could be true. So... I'm I'm curious to see it, and I, I I hope that it involves this new UI, and I hope that they give the people who are waiting for this kind of thing some hope that they're serious about bringing over the Windows Phone UI to these devices and doing the right thing. You know, and I guess we'll see, but um, that is certainly the plan. Okay. But it's just that you know every day that goes by. You hear a lot of things in the news about, you know, Galaxy tabs and honeycomb tablets and iPads and HP Web OS and RIM's got a playbook coming out. And it seems like everyone's involved, you know, everyone except for Microsoft. So, I mean, I just wish, you know, I guess we can't make Windows 8 happen faster than it's going to. But I think we're at the point now where they need to at least show us what they're planning, you know. Time has so, come, my friends. Yeah, yeah. Well, Apple's played their hand, right? So we know what That's actually iPad... a good point. We know exactly, although Apple, you know, there's all these rumors, iPad 3, that maybe they would do something in September. I don't think that's going to happen. That's once a year. Once I, a I year. will say this about that. I obviously have no in, uh, insider information that way, of course. But last year when they released the iPad, I, I looked at this thing and I thought, they're going to have to change this before Christmas. Nope. There's no way nope. that this thing will go that long. Mm -hmm. um, and I figured at the very million units. Well, but before Christmas, it was more like seven million over two quarters. So right. uh, it seemed like what they would have to do is l reduce the prices or you know do something. And I, I really expected some kind of upgrade. 
and was surprised when it didn't happen. So when I hear well, the, the real issue, this, the real issue is, and we talked about this yesterday on MacBreak Weekly, that when you have a product that gets updated in uh, March and comes out in March, it's yeah. your Christmas sales, you're selling something that is almost know, at the tough. end of its cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not a good time. Announced in September. Yes. Uh, right, right. So, yeah, well, we'll get to the iPad. But, yeah, I, I'm I'm surprised. I'm surprised by a lot of what I, I saw. Yeah, here, yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> yo, Windows 7 phone. Windows Phone 7. Wait, I'm going to check my phone and see if my update's here. Free update is back. <laughs> so for you Samsung Focus owners, like I would myself, be, I would be, I th aren't you snake bit? Aren't you a little uh, reluctant to? Uh, Leo, I'm going to install this thing the second yeah, that it appears. You're a brave I'm, man. <laughs> well, this see, is this two is, reasons. This is why you're beloved. You have the the nerve, the grace, the calm under pressure, the intensity, intensity of intestinal fortitude. You like that guy walking on the beach in Apocalypse Now, and the bombs are <laughs> dropping. Yeah, around. You have such courage. Yeah, I or stu it's stupidity, but I love the smell of PVCs in the morning. It <laughs> smells like Windows yeah. phones. I love the seven. smell of software updates in the morning. <laughs> I, uh, for better or worse, <laughs> this, I, is so, I, this is how badly nerdy we are. We think updating your phone is a cur an act of courage. Hey, Leo, this has bricked phones. This is. <laughs> In in our world, this is brave. You're a fighter, Paul. <laughs> I could be without my phone, Leo, for oh minutes. My God. For minutes, <laughs> I would have to use one of these many other phones I have here. Horrors! <laughs> the horror. An awful fate that would be. Yeah. You know. Oh, so, horror. No, but the re th there are two reasons. You know, one is uh, a. I'm just curious to see when it does nothing. I can't wait. But also, you know, I've been waiting for, I mean, uh, listen, I, I don't mean to overplay my hand here, but, you know, people bought these phones in October or November or whatever, and, and they've been waiting for an update. You know, I, I've had this damn thing since like July, and I've been waiting for an update too. I mean, I, I, I have never seen this thing update ever, you know, not even once. I never even got the test update they sent over last summer. I'm convinced there is software code at Microsoft that literally looks for my name and then doesn't deliver the update. Whatever you do. Based on that fact. Do not update Therat's phone. Right. So, you know, yeah. yeah I, I, I'm waiting. I want, I want to see the update. You know, I want, to, I want to see it. I still haven't seen it. I don't know. So they turn it on, I guess, but I, I don't so, have it. And this is fixed, presumably. It's not going to brick phones anymore. No. They, obviously, they fixed all the problems. What could of go course. wrong? Why wouldn't? I mean, don't Leo, you think the they test this stuff? company in the world. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. But. So, and of course, this paves the way for no-do, you know, the first real update. They call uh, that what? No-do? No-do, like no donuts. Um, Bad donuts. dog, no donut? Yeah, it's just... No-do? Really? That's the code name? N-O-D-O? -O? Yeah. I think it stands for no deploy or something, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's coming eventually. It could come as early as next week, so I guess we'll see. Oh, 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 no. The chat room says, no, it's pronounced no, duh. Duh. <laughs> no, duh. Not no, duh. No, duh. No, duh. No profit. Well, as, as always, I bow to the crowd wisdom of the chat they room. You know what it means. <laughs> so, it's probably a mountain in Japan. You yeah. know what I bought? No. And I've abandoned immediately the Nokia N8. I don't know what I was thinking. You know, I, I took, so I was just in Spain. Yes. Everybody uses took, them in there. Yeah, for now. Uh, I took pictures of uh, Nokia ads all over the city. They yeah. were everywhere. And yeah. uh, it wasn't N8, I don't think. I thought I thought it was, there was an X6 and I want to say a C9 maybe. Oh, they have a lot of models. The N8 yeah. is their premier smartphone, 12 megapixel camera. And it's actually a Symbian 3. It's nice. It's nice. It, it feels nice. like you're using a phone at about, you know, I'd say 2004. Yikes. So I think the big advantage of those phones, if I'm not mistaken, is actually the camera. 12 so, megapixels. Well, but it's not just the megapixels. I, I believe that they have some kind of superior photo software. Microsoft was clearly very interested in this aspect of Nokia mm. and getting that into Windows Phone. Really? So I didn't notice that. So that was the trade, the tit for tat, was uh, Nokia gave him some uh, technology in return for... Yes, yeah. because to be honest, Nokia needs Windows Phone 7 much more than Microsoft needs yeah, yeah, Symbian yeah, yeah, 3. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're going to roll their OV, you know, marketplace into the Windows Phone marketplace and all that stuff. They can but dump that. most of the Nokia stuff is going to go away. But if I'm not mistaken, 
part of this agreement was that some of the core imaging technology huh. that Nokia has is going to make its way to all Windows phones. I'll take a look. Yeah. I shall take a look. So you bought the Where did you buy this? Amazon. Oh, on Amazon. Online. How much was it? Well, that was why I bought it. It was a mere $300. Really? $100 less than the, you know, kind of typical. Yeah. Is it a unlocked phone? like a Unlocked. Uh, put a T-Mobile SIM in it. You know, in yeah. many ways, it's attractive. It's a little bulky, a little clunky, but uh, in many ways, it's a very nice phone. It's not so fast. Uh, Is it a touch screen or a... Touch uh, screen. I'll bring it in and I'll show you. I'll give you a little demo of it. It's it's not it's not bad it's just it's you know uh yeah yeah it's a little it's a little late if if it had come out four years ago it would be like this phone is fantastic yeah the problem is four years ago they wouldn't have come out with this phone right well that's it, true this is, this is you know their probably their initial iphone response i would imagine yeah you're right hmm hmm hmm, hmm. Oh, uh, well, so much for Nokia. When did they come out? When did the Windows... I was gone when this thing happened. I only kind of saw the, yeah. the tail end dribbling across my... I think my... we're going to see the first ones this year, late this year, and then they're saying 2012. For I the think big... Nokia builds good hardware. Uh, it should yeah. be, they should be nice phones. I'm, although, i got to say, Samsung and, uh, and the others are kind of... HTC have really eclipsed even that. Well, I, you know, not that this... A week in Spain means anything, but I, I these phones were all over the place. Uh, oh yeah, I, Nokia I don't owns think I these saw, markets. I don't think I saw an iPhone the entire time I was no, there. No, and that's why I bought the uh, uh, N8 is because I I've been traveling and I saw a lot of them around. It's funny what you see, you know, what people use, right? right. It's always interesting. I thought, uh, well, there must be a still, reason. Yeah, huh. still lots of flip phones and things like that, but yeah. you know, people are messaging on the numeric keyboard, which always freaks me out and. A surprising number of iPhones, though, out there. I don't know about Spain, but uh, in South yeah. America. I'm always surprised at how many smartphones, uh, iPhones, I see. Right, right. Hmm. 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 Um, let's see. Let's take a break. All right. I have an Audible ad for you, so I, I want you to give us an Audible plug here. Okay. But uh, before we do that, I do want to mention our friends at Squarespace. I know you're looking for blogging platform squarespace is content management and hosting so i like it that it's together so you pay one price and you get the best i mean really the best content management software out there at squarespace but you also get their really robust hosting their virtual their java virtual server stuff it's i mean you look i'm saying this because i'm a geek you don't need to know about any of this but it really is amazing you cannot bring a squarespace site down and god knows we try Squarespace.com slash Windows. Again, if you like Paul, use that code. Squarespace.com slash Windows. Truth is, you don't need to. If you just go to Squarespace.com, you're going to get that green button. But we want to get, get Paul some credit. The green button says try it for free. And you don't have to give him a credit card or anything. This You could do this, Paul, right now. It'll take you a second. All you do is get a site name, password, email address, and then the CAPTCHA so that it's not a robot. And now you've got a site with all the features of Squarespace. There's no nothing turned off. It's just limited to two weeks. But that's enough time to, to really get to understand all the features like the social, great social widgets that automatically, seamlessly, and highly customizably allow you to add widgets for your favorite social networks. Here's the Flickr widget. It gives you a slideshow or a thumbnail view. There's, I mean, it's, of course, you're starting with these great templates, 60-plus designer styles that you completely control, again, with sliders, a lot of Ajax in here, and even CSS and JavaScript. So you can make your Squarespace site look exactly like your existing site if you want. Uh, although I have a feeling your Squarespace site's going to look even better. All you have to do is look at these example sites to get an idea. Try it free for 30 days. There's an iPhone and iPad app that makes it very easy to post and moderate comments. You can import from all the existing engines using the standard APIs and export too, so you're never stuck. A lot of photographers and artists use it because it looks so good. A lot of geeks use it because it works so well. You're going to love it. Squarespace dot com slash windows give it a try today um apple said no microsoft complained about the app store <laughs> so microsoft yeah, wants app, to do an app store uh right what they don't want is apple to get an app store trademark oh so they've asked the u.s uh patent and trademark office to deny apple's claim for they a wanted to trademark the words app store 
Yeah. Wow. So uh, have you not seen Apple's response to Microsoft? It's actually really funny. What did Apple say? Uh, it's just, it's full of inflammatory language. Oh. It's really, it's beautiful. They've it says, feisty. Steve you know, was Mi feisty. Microsoft is missing the forest for the trees. Wow. Um, it's really, it's really interesting. And, uh, you know, it's funny. They, they bring up something that I noticed when Microsoft complained, which was that Microsoft had this image of all of the other app stores that are out there, uh, none of which were named App Store. And that's the point, <laughs> right? That's the somehow name. over the past two, three years, all these right. companies have released their own online stores. None of them have thought to use the term App Store. Right. Um, and obviously none of them are as popular as Apple's App Store, but... Um, Microsoft's point was simply that the word app and the word store are both too generic and thus cannot be trademarked, whereas uh, Apple argues that when used together, um, it becomes a trademarkable term. And <laughs> more to the point, I think, um, they, <laughs> they mentioned that, you know, Microsoft's often uh, content, or, uh, controversial trademarking of the word Windows, for example, is an example of where uh, a company can own a generic term right. and, and still own a trademark. Um, everyone, you know, when you hear Windows, thinks of Microsoft Windows. So we'll see. But they, they, this, um, it's good reading. I mean, if you're looking for, if you, you can't sleep some night, uh, this thing's like 60 some odd pages oh, long. Wow. And it, it, it is actually, it's pretty funny. They brought in a, ling uh, a linguistics expert. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, it's 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 fascinating. I this mean, it's is what just, happens when you have an entire office building full of lawyers working for you, right? They right. Have, they, have the, they have the time and will to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> when I first saw Microsoft's complaint, my take on it was simply, you know, Microsoft's making a good point. I, I this stuff is it, obviously these are generic terms, but then you read Apple's response, and it's actually far more. I mean, it, it, when you strip away all of the inflammatory stuff, which is I find very humorous, I also believe that Apple had, makes some interesting points here too. So I'm, I, I no longer really have an opinion on this. Uh, I don't really either, because sure. you see this like Facebook trying to tr basically own the word face. Yeah, and you see this stuff all the time. Sure. And I know a little bit about it because, you know, Twit, I thought when we created Twit in 2005, well, mm -hmm. this is one trademark nobody's ever going to want. Right. And then a year later, up along comes this thing, Twitter, and there's 800 companies that use the Twit <laughs> part of Twitter, and all of a sudden, my trademark is like, whoa, not so good. Sure. But I'm not going to, I mean, good Lord. Uh, the, sure. the, I found out very quickly that the cost of pursuing this is huge. Yeah, you you would spend the rest of your life and all of your money, right? Litigating these companies over right. nothing, yeah. right? And you know, uh, Twitter was actually very helpful on that. Uh, they know uh, they don't want this to they don't want there, there to be an issue. They know we predate them, and mm -hmm. there's just confusion. It look you know the the worst sure. thing is uh, when a secondary trademark, a later trademark, suddenly becomes so dominant as Twitter has become that people think that I copied Twitter. It's called reverse confusion. <laughs> and that's the worst thing. You know, that's that's really bad. Uh, yes. And so it's, they understand that. So they actually encouraged people who would use, you don't see it anymore. A lot of these companies that use Twit, Twitter mm -hmm. said, don't use Twit. You, we, we reserve the rights for Twitter and we want you to use Tweet. We reserve Tweet for you. And so, okay. no, the new companies are mostly Tweet, like Tweet Deck and stuff. And yep, yep. Um, and I think that I think that that's I'm going to interpret that as goodwill from the big guys at Twitter. Sure. Because well, uh, let's face it, they don't have any money either. So that's true. We're more profitable <laughs> than they are. <laughs> yeah. They may be bigger, but we're more profitable. Isn't that funny? Of course, yeah. they got more money because they got a, a lot of investors. Sure. So, did you notice that Steve Jobs, um, when uh, yesterday misquoted the CEO of Samsung in the um, I did not. His little, yeah, this is uh, this is the quote that the Steve put up on the screen. As you heard, our selling was quite aggressive, around two million. They're talking about the uh, Samsung Galaxy Tab. In yep. terms of sellout, we believe it was small. Um, he said quite smooth, <laughs> not quite small. Oh, that's awesome! So Steve just decided to use the misinterpretation. Sure. Uh, you know, Apple at Apple events, uh, there is a segment at the beginning, which is I, I, I refer to it myself as 
we are awesome and the rest yeah. of you suck. The self-congratulatory moment. Yeah, and it was actually, I have to say, at the iPad 2 event, this was a small part of the keynote. It's usually much longer. <laughs> and it was interesting to me. I, I think the primary thing I got out of it was we have 65,000 apps. They have 100, which is kind of a bogus right. claim because, you know, the other platform isn't technically even really launched yet, if I'm right. not mistaken. Um, but whatever, you know, I think they made a good point that the iPad is an established mature brand and this other stuff is not quite there yet. Um, so that little quote was both unnecessary and now that I know that it is incorrect, I mean, it's stupid. You know, it's yeah. just, it's strange, you know. But, you know, they can't help themselves. They love to get the little digs in, yeah, you know. it's the reality distortion field. Although I have to say, it's I very, don't remember. It's very petty. I don't very remember petty. Steve being so petty before. Really? Really? Has he been? Does he really <laughs> yes. go? See, it seems like oh, a bad yeah. idea to mention the other guys because it just gives them more power. Yeah. Does he tradition? No, they, they mention it. it. You know, I, I, I've said this for years. You know, uh, people would complain about Microsoft and their market dominance and everything. And I would say, you know, imagine what the world would be like if Apple was in charge, though, right? I mean, imagine how much oh, worse. Oh, I said they're that so, for years. They're so petty. Yeah. You know? No, I said uh, if, you, if you think Microsoft's a monopolist, just yeah. wait and see when if 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 Apple ever gets that kind of market share, what Apple does. Yeah, well now you know. Now we so. know. They didn't get it in the uh, desktop operating system, but they sure have it in consumer devices. Yeah, uh, and that ultimately may be, prove to be a much more lucrative market. So. Oh, I guarantee you, it is. It's yeah. the market to be in. Uh, Windows in Tune. You talked about this a, a while ago. This is yeah. a, a new product for Microsoft to help you tune up your PC. Is this kind of their? Well, it's a. It's more of a management oh, service. Management. Okay. Yeah. So they they talked about this last year. It's finally coming out. So it's it's shipping later this month. It's basically a way for. It's for businesses of all sizes. But the reality, I think, for this first version is that there's not a lot of enterprise integration stuff in there. So it's more small businesses. And it's just a way to manage your PCs from the cloud. So instead of installing all this Microsoft server hard, uh, server software on servers in in some environment, you could just you know pay a monthly fee and have this stuff occur for you from the cloud. And management of PCs involves such things as you know security software, making sure it's up to date across your uh, environment. You know, make sure all your software licenses are on up to date and so forth and all that. So um, I, this is just one of those areas where I, I this is. One of those things that I, I, if you said to me, what do, you, what do you think a PC management service is? I'm not even sure I'd be able to answer the question. But now that I see it, it actually makes a lot of sense to me. And I think it's a good example where Microsoft's not getting a lot of credit for, here's this company that has a certain way of doing business and a certain kind of product that they make. And they're moving all of it to the cloud, you know, in a way that makes sense, right? You start with the high value, uh, obvious targets, you know, things like exchange with email and calendar. Um, you know, the collaboration stuff that they have in SharePoint, obviously another great target for that. Um, you know, their live communication, instant messaging uh, type stuff also moving to the cloud. SQL Server and Windows Azure and all that stuff. And, you know, now they're moving management to the cloud. So the, the interesting thing about this approach is just that if you were to look at Google type solutions, not that they have anything that's exactly this, uh, Google approaches everything from the cloud because that's the kind of company they are. But Microsoft because they're a, a traditional software company with a background offers both options, right? Where they have cloud-based stuff and on-premises stuff and best of all ways to integrate them together. So if you want to have some stuff in the cloud, some stuff on site and so forth, um, you can do that. So I think that windows into this first version is going to have the biggest mark, I think on small businesses, because these are the types of companies where they don't have people who can manage servers can't afford them in the first place, but they can pay $11 per computer per month and you get a license for Windows 7 Enterprise as part of it and you get all this, you know, all, all the auto updating stuff and all that. And uh, it, it's it's a neat service, something to look into. So uh, there'll be a free trial period of some number of weeks, but it's coming out on, it's March 23rd. Yeah, March twenty third. It's funny then, because as I become, uh, you know, as we, you know, we're actually contracting out our IT services and stuff. Mm -hmm. and we start, you know, I'm sort of aware of this stuff all of a sudden, and uh, I can see the, yeah. uh, I can see the. Well, I used to hire guys, you know. Yeah, uh, we are. It, we're hiring a guy. That's and then what you, we're doing. It's expensive. They leave, and you don't know right. how they did something right. or what the password was for this or whatever exactly. it is, you know. And it's it's 
I, I think this stuff is really smart. I mean, I think in, in, in homes, you know, obviously home server has sort of very basic uh, capabilities around this stuff, and it makes some sense. And then Microsoft has the small business server products, which also have some, you know, little bits of this here and there and so forth. But I, I think that, you know, uh, this just goes back to that argument. You know, you're, you're in business to do whatever it is. You make widgets or you sell something or whatever it is. And, but you need these things. You know, you need technology and you need... You do. Uh, email and calendar and all this stuff. And, and I guess you could buy a computer and put that stuff on there and then service it yourself. But that is, you know, we're going to look back at that behavior and just laugh, you know, mm -hmm. at how silly that is, you know, mm -hmm. um, how much time, money and effort we've spent just managing technology, you know. Anyway, so this thing will be out. I, I'm writing an article about it for the, the print magazine. I'll so. be very curious if it could do as well as, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's one of those things. Yeah, so it's going to evolve over time. Uh, and for the bigger businesses, it doesn't have the Active Directory integration that's meaningful that I think they're going to want. Um, but it's going to get there. Uh, and Microsoft, uh, and this is very rare, is being very transparent about their plans for the future. Um, you know, because they want some of the bigger businesses, I think, to evaluate it now with an understanding of here, here's how it's going to change over the next couple of years. Um, and they're basically, if you think think about it, if you if you know anything about their management software or servers, uh, the system center stuff, their their goal is to replicate that as a cloud service over time. Smart, very smart. <laughs> Isn't yes. that a, that sounds like a like that would be an ad slogan? Smart, very smart, very smart. Yeah. You can have that. Anybody wants that? That's yours. I give it to you. Not so smart. <laughs> iPhone not four apparently not so Verizon. Smart, but it same problem, according to Consumer Reports, anyway. Although, I, you know, here's why this is a very controversial thing. If you live somewhere yeah. where you have a great signal, Verizon or AT&T, you don't see these problems. It's only the marginal areas that see these sure. problems. So This is just, I, I think the important bit here is people need to know that this is the case so they can test it for themselves. Well, you know, and that it is the iPhone, iPhone, not the carrier. People were blaming AT&T. Okay, it's on Verizon. Same thing. I, I think the, the iPhone 4 laid bare the lie that was blame AT&T for everything. Right. You know, um, that was true last summer. It's even more true now on Verizon. I mean, I look, AT&T is terrible. Don't get me wrong. but <laughs> they, they, This is not a love letter to AT&T. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, AT&T has their good points too, but... Um, yeah, they're terrible. Absolutely terrible. They're worse than Verizon from a, you know, you want to travel around the country and have, a, you know, and, and actually be able to make a phone call. They're absolutely worse. There's no doubt about it. But they've also gotten a lot better over time. You know, I switched over to AT&T the day the iPhone came out, the first one, and I've certainly regretted that decision in many ways and absolutely would have switched to Verizon that first couple of years at, at the drop of a hat at, at, and at any cost if given the option. But now that it's 2011 and the the iPhone is on Verizon, yeah, I don't care anymore. You know, it's not it's it, I really, it's not really it's not the big deal it was because AT&T has gotten better. Right. You know, and and making that kind of a, a switch doesn't make that much sense to me, but anyway, the point of this isn't to disparage the iPhone 4, although of course I would take any opportunity to do that. It is <laughs> rather that if you're considering buying such a device, I, I, this is the wrong time to do it, right? We we know an, a new iPhone's coming out this year, right. so anyone who would buy this thing right now is... Apple uh, said, I thought that was interesting, a million iPhones at Verizon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was kind of surprised, because I would think that most Verizon customers would say, well, wait, I'll wait till June. Yep. Well, people aren't that smart. <laughs> but then, so, interestingly... Uh, uh, iOS 4.4, uh, which is going to come out concurrently with the new iPad, will not be, apparently, will be GSM only. That means not available to Verizon customers. So uh, already... That might, that might suggest an LTE type of thing, though. Maybe. But we'll see. You know, we'll see. I mean... Maybe. I mean, there, that's there will interesting. Be an iPhone. There'll be an iPhone 5. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we know that much. I think we know that much. <laughs> yeah. I, I, we decided to take this year off. We have enough money. You know, it's not yeah, what you're going to do. We don't need more money. No. <laughs> so, Apple is doing yeah, just yeah, fine. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to give you a year off so you can save yeah. up for the next one. Right. We don't want to rush it. Yeah. Um, do you feel they rushed iPad 2? Because it really no, is just no, an incremental no, no, upgrade, no. isn't it? I mean, it's no, not it a huge yeah. upgrade. 
Well, let me ask you. So Twice I, as fast. That's a big I, deal. I guess so. You know, I, first of all, I don't know if it is twice as fast. Remember, you said up to twice as fast. Um, well, it's dual core. I mean, it's it's okay. that new, you know, dual arm. Not twice as fast, but... I, we're uh, right, close to twice as fast. So okay. Sort of but twice as fast. I, I, I think that when you look at things like a certain percentage lighter, a certain percentage thinner, a certain percentage faster, yada, yada, yada... I think what you've just added this thing up to is like, right, it's the next version. That's what we expect. We always expect the new one to be better. You know, that's kind of like the baseline. So I, I, I get without, I don't want to spend a half an hour on the iPad too, but I, I wanted to bring up a couple of things that A, I haven't necessarily written about yet, or um, maybe just aren't obvious, or I not, don't know if other people have noticed this kind of stuff, but it is very unusual when Apple releases a product to a new version of a product for them to not drop the price or bump up the storage while keeping the same price. I could be wrong. In fact, I'm sure someone is scrambling to look this up right now. But if you were to go back and look at all of the iPods that ever came down the pike, all of the iPhones, I don't think you would ever find an upgrade where that was the case. I don't believe that has ever happened. So usually you bring a, you know, you go from version one to two or whatever. And, you know, the storage at each price point goes up. So that when they, well, we didn't lower prices, but you got more. Well, you got more. But I think they have more in other areas. I think part of the reason for this is that there's only so much NAND flash in the world. And yeah. I think Apple's already got cornered the market. Well, I think, the, well, so the, I, I think the, I think that what this shows me, or I will say what this does show me, is that Apple isn't in, is in a good position here. Because they would have done that if they had had to, but they don't have to, right? right? Well, that, so I could, the, that I'd agree with you on. They just, one they, of the things no that pressure. people... Yeah, so people will say, uh, well, you know, these other iPad, these other iPad competitors are more expensive. What's what's up with that? You know, you right. said the iPad was so expensive. Um, there are some reasons for that. I mean, they have more expensive parts in some cases, actually, or Apple has, in fact, uh, grabbed a lot of the supply for things like flash RAM and screens and so forth. So that bumps up the prices for those guys. But it is interesting to me that none of the Android guys have really been able to push Apple on price. It's Un, it's not expected. You know, I, I expected cheaper devices. And so. price is the key. Well, there are cheaper devices, but but they're crappy. Price is the key, but, you know, I, I it's it shouldn't be the key because, honestly, to me, the key is the other stuff. Right. I think the reason that the iPad is the better choice is the other stuff. That, you know, that initial price is whatever, but, you know, y you need that ecosystem support. And I think that's where the iPad really pushes ahead of the other stuff. And is the reason why you should always look at an iPad first if this is the type of thing you're looking for. You know where Apple's yeah. brilliant? They're going to get 30 bucks for a piece of rubber with some magnets in it. That probably yeah. cost them 53 cents to make. Actually, they're going to get 69 for it because you're going to want gonna the leather. You're going to get the leather. leather. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And you know what? Everybody's going to buy it because it's, it's actually a clever design and none of the other cases work. Uh, I've gone through so many. I, I barely use my iPad, and I've, I think I've owned five cases for the thing. I can't stand any of the cases. No, I hate the Apple case. No. I, well, the, I Apple hate case the old Apple case really was just a blatant grab for money. I mean, it was it was junky. Yeah. But this one at least has some pretty cool features it's, and design. It's beautiful. No, it looks beautiful. I, and I, think and I just think it's hysterical because you know it's almost pure profit. This is Apple doesn't need to sell you, a, you know, Apple Care anymore. They make their they don't have to sell you insurance. They just make their money on cases that you have to buy. Sure. No, and, I, oh, and a $30 smart. cable that you're going to need for your HDMI. So that's yep. just pure profit. So, yeah, the other thing that's going to happen out of that, though, is that they've built these magnets into the device. So right. other, other people can make cases like this. Right. And that, that will be interesting. So, yeah. I, I, look, I, I think the case thing's fine. I have no problem with that. I think that's nice. Oh, it's um, a great American tradition. <laughs> make yeah. as much damn money um, as you can. When, when they put AirPlay into the iPad last year... You know, one of the first things I did was, you, you look at this and you think, well, AirPlay is interesting. I, I can play content from the iPod to something else. But what I really want is... Right. The other way. I have, I have yeah, the other way. Like, why isn't that part of this, you know? Right. And now they're adding home sharing support. This is like one of those duh things. I mean, I had one of my... Huge. Topics ...was literally something that does this. Because, you know, my content's on my PC. Right. Um, you know, you bring the, iMa the iPad around the house... Um, Maybe you want to listen to it when you're in a shower or you watch a podcast when you're shaving or whatever it is. Um, you know, syncing it to the device is stupid. Right. You know, so this, this they fixed that. That's neat. It was a very small thing, right? It's an iOS 4.0 whatever feature as well. So it, it, this will work on 
iPod touches and, and, uh, and iPhones. It's great. I think it's, it's a great idea. I think this, this move to bring more and more of the Mac experience, meaning the applications, to the iPad is very interesting. And if you're a Mac fan, this should be very troubling because uh, Macs have always been too expensive, in my opinion. But regardless of my opinion, they've always been more expensive than PCs. They just are. Right. And iPads, I, I mean, I'm still kind of, I'm trying to wrestle with this notion that iPads aren't expensive, but compared to a Mac, iPads aren't expensive. Right. That's if true. you can get the stuff that you want, in other words, most people who buy a, a Mac are not looking for Mac OS X. They're, they're looking for those apps, right? And if the apps that you want are available on the iPad and the experience is better and it's more portable and it gets way better battery life, and by the way, it's a lot less expensive, for a lot of those normal people, that becomes suddenly the obvious choice. So when you say like, well, this is this unnecessary side thing that costs $700, it's kind of a tough swallow. But if it is replacing a $1,500 MacBook Pro, hmm, interesting. Hmm. Now it's cheaper. This is, this is interesting. I mean, it's, and we, you know, we've talked about this, the, the notion that PCs will come down to these devices and that the devices will move up to PCs and they'll kind of meet in the middle. And I really think that this is the start of that, you know. Um, and it's so dumb. It's like photo booth and iMovie and it's like, really? You know, this is like, a, I, I think this is a big deal. I, I think this is a very big deal. Um, and it's I agree. The, it's it's the dumb little things that are going to make people want this. I was I think that actually uh, people uh, didn't get what this really means, but it's um, yeah, it's it's going to be transformational. And then with the HDMI cable, it almost makes the iPad a uh, a home theater pad. Yeah. Yep. It's very interesting. Oh, it's, or for people who are on the go and uh, right. want to give presentations. Right. Uh, I, this is it's incredible. I mean, this stuff is incredible. You know, the, I, I was interested to see that Apple added an iPhone 4 feature, an iPhone only, I, an iPhone 4 only feature. Uh, and I know that the Verizon iPhone has this hotspot feature, but they added it to AT&T. Right. And it is interesting, you know, nine months into the 12-month life cycle of this device, essentially, they're adding a feature specifically for that device. Isn't that interesting? Um, yeah, and I'm not sure that that means anything. I mean, obviously, iOS is updated over time and new features come and everything. But the fact that they singled out the iPhone, I thought it was very interesting. It shows a, a level of support for a device that should, it should be heartening to people that have adopted this platform. I mean, it's, um, it's a good sign. You know, Apple, like we said, you know, very aggressive usually about getting rid of their old stuff. Um, it's nice to see something like that, I guess. Yeah. Paul's going to uh, give us our Windows 7 app of the week in just a second. Um, our Windows 7 app and our Windows Phone 7 app. We've got two of them. I changed the name. And one of them's for dummies. <laughs> but I used it, so you know it's good. Yeah, you know it works. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to talk a little bit about something we haven't talked about in a while, and I just, uh, I'm glad they're back because I missed them. Audible.com, and I know you're a big Audible fan, and I, I tell you, I, I was actually missing them because uh, I lent uh, Roger my Mustang, and uh, so I couldn't listen to my... Uh, my books, and I was missing my Audible books. Even if it's a 10-minute drive, I want my Audible books. Audible.com. Check it out. It is the place for your audiobooks. It's basically a library of audiobooks. 75,000. 75,000 titles. I want, to, I want you to get that. 75,000 titles. Well, part of the reason I mention that is because it's, it's difficult to pick them. That's why I love talking about Audible. When you meet other people who use Audible, that's the first thing when you have that conversation. They say, oh, so what's good? What are you listening to? It's part of the fun of it is saying, what's the good books? So we do that on the show too. Now, here's the, here's the deal. Uh, we are going to give you uh, a free month. If you go to audible.com slash windows, and again, please use that windows so Paul gets the credit. Audible.com slash windows. Uh, you will uh, be able to get uh, sign up for the gold account. That's a book a month and get your first book free. There's so many great choices out there that I thought it'd be kind of fun to uh, let Paul pick one. So, Paul, what is your pick of the week? <clears throat> so, this is actually from my friend Jeff. I, I mentioned Jeff a few weeks back. I think you were on vacation with Tom uh, when Tom Merritt was doing this. Um, he has been needling me 
<laughs> for over a year now to read this book. And I, ha I it's interesting. Uh, we, I've recommended a couple of Alan first books on oh, the I podcast. I love Alan for so much. <clears throat> and he had come to me at some point over the last year and said, hey, I need something to read. Do you have any recommendations? I said, yeah, you got to read anything by this guy. Yep. And yep. He has now read every single book this guy has written, and he was going on and on and on about um, what I think was the first in the series. And uh, so when I went on my trip to Spain, I, I purchased that book um, as well as the book I'm recommending this week, which is The Name of the Wind. King Killer Chronicles Day One, and it you is the get, first. By the way, more different, dif different, different than an Alan First yes, novel. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, that's true, right? So this is a fantasy, you know, novel. There so, are no unicorns yeah. in Alan First novels, <laughs> right? So Jeff and I uh, grew up together, and we grew up reading a lot of the, you know, Tolkien type books and yeah. the sci-fi and the fantasy, you know, Asimov yeah. and um, Jerry Purnell and Larry Niven and all right. that stuff, and right. and all of that's I, I on was, Audible, by the way. Yeah, so he, Jeff uh, had some interesting suggestions around science fiction, but as we go, we've gotten older, um, I think it's, oh, it, well, science fiction isn't too bad. And, of course, a lot of the classic guys are still around. You know, Niven and uh, Purnell uh, are still around, for example, and still writing, which is great. Um, but, you know, fantasy is a little bit of a tougher sell, you know. I'm, I'm so jaded that, for me, everything is just a Lord of the Rings ripoff, and I couldn't right. care less. And I look at things like Harry Potter, and I think, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, this was great in the 1960s when it was called The Chronicles of Narnia. Like, I don't get it, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the conversations I had had with Jeff was just about how hard it is to find any decent fantasy, right. you know. And well, so I have, I have not actually read this yet. They tend to be bodice rippers kind of things, too, a lot I of just, times. I, yeah, and I don't care for that I don't kind want of stuff. That, I, no. I just, you know. So... Uh, I will, this is new to me as well, and um, I'm told it's fantastic. Actually, Tom had the author on his, one of his other podcasts with you, and uh, I guess he does kind of a fantasy and sci-fi. He does, yeah. He does a sword What's and called? laser, sword and laser, sword, which sword is actually laser, not, yeah. not ours. Revision 3 does it, but uh, Tom Oh, I'm sorry, excuse no, me. That's, so, no, it's a great show. I love it. I'm a huge fan. So he uh, had the author on, and I guess at the time, his, the second book in the series was just coming out, and in fact... The second book in the series is out now. Uh, it just came out in you know paper form. So this is the first one. So I'm going to go back and uh, I will. This is the next one. I got to finish up my my Alan first book first. But um, I'm putting it on my list too. Yeah, yeah. And and I met you know because we were talking about this with Tom. Uh, Tom and I. I, you know, he said to me. He said, Yeah, this book is. You know, this book's the fantastic. name of the wind. King Killer Chronicles. Day one. Day two is coming. Patrick Rothfuss is the yeah. author, R-O-T-H-F-U-S-S. -S. Now, this is yours free, um, and it's 27 hours and 58 minutes, so it's uh, you get a lot of book for free, and I like to do that, to give you value for a dollar. This is your first book. It's free. There are a lot of good choices. Uh, somebody in the chat room saying, uh, are the Piers Anthony books on Audible? Yes, they are. The Immortality uh, series is great. I love it. There's quite a book. I mean, look, Audible has really beefed up its sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, they have all the best sellers. They have, uh, you know, if it's audio, they've got it. So try it today. Audible.com slash Windows. I see that they're having a sale on uh, last chance at one credit. So you get that first credit. Cutting for stone. I'm looking at this, too. This looks like it might be pretty good. It's a sweeping, emotionally riveting first novel of family saga of Africa and America. Doctors and patients, exiles and homes. I like long-ass books. <laughs> if you're looking for like the classic sci-fi, uh, there's a lot of good Larry oh. Niven and Jerry Purnell oh, yeah. on there. Get now. those if you uh, haven't gotten football. those. I've listened to them all. Yep, yep. Lucifer Sammers, Ringworld yep. is on there. Moten God's Love Eye is on Ring there. World. Love Moten uh, God's Eye. Classic. Yep. Classic. Audible.com slash Windows. Look, we love it. I know you'll love it. Try it free right now. Sign up for the gold account. And please use Audible.com slash Windows because we want Paul to get every drop of the available credit <laughs> For listening to this show. All right, Paul, I want some free stuff. <laughs> okay. Give me some, give me your Windows 7 app of the week. So I had written up my article about, I, I, things, hello. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I just hello. did something and sound came out of my, ah! uh, <laughs> you know, about some of the ways that OS 10 could and should influence Windows. And, you know, one of the little pet peeves I have is, in Windows, is that, the recycle bin is on the desktop, which is fine if it's visible. Right. But when you need to do stuff it's and it's invisible, you, you, yeah. you contort things on the screen so you can get a little right. hole up in the corner. You can see the damn thing. And 
I've always thought, you know, we've, we get this taskbar in Windows 7. Like, why, why couldn't it just be in the taskbar? Like, why, why wouldn't it be in the taskbar, you know? So, um, let me see if I have... Uh, yes, I'm sorry. David Bianco recommended this to me. Um, a guy named Mike Edward Morris wrote a little tray, you know, tray app. Sits in your tray. It looks Perfect. like the tray app. That's where 7. the trash should live. Yeah, and it looks it's it's neat because it looks like the other icons. It's really nicely Perfect. integrated, and it works great. So I've been using it for the past week, and um, it's fantastic. So Perfect. Simple little thing. It's at e dash sushi dot net. <laughs> of course it is. Of course, it's, why would it? Of course be? it is e dash sushi. Yes. Dot net. If you like sushi, you'll love e sushi. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called mini mini bin. Mini bin, not not dot not dot com dot net. By the way, yes, sorry about that. Dot com. No, no, you said it right. It's dot net, and I like the page actually. It's kind of cool. There it is. There's yeah, the yeah. Typewriter font. Yeah, it's really nice. Really nice. I uh, like I'm it. Impressed. I want to hire this guy. Wow, look <laughs> at this. This is cool. Yeah. Mini bin. All right, Mini move. Bin. He's from Dusseldorf. <laughs> Moving along to the Windows. Phone 7 app of the week. Yeah, Windows Phone does not have a rich selection of language apps as of yet. Uh, uh, but there is really? one of the, you know, the dummies books. They have it. Uh, I almost said IDG at, uh, well, I guess they're at Wiley now. Oh, really? Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. What happened to IDG? They, I, I think they merged to got bought. Or, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're gone. Huh. So they have an app. And, and they probably have multiple apps. I'm, I keep hoping they can come up with a French app. But they have a an app for Windows Phone called Basic Spanish for Dummies. It's styled like the dummy stuff. You know, it's all yellow and black and everything. It's only 99 cents, and it's decent. And we, we use this in Spain um, as a dictionary. So, you, you know, you're in a restaurant, and right. you get like 90% of it. It's, Spain was pretty easy from a language standpoint, but every once in a while, you'd stumble over this word, uh, usually in a menu, I think was the big one, where... It's like, what is, it, what is this? Or, there was one, and I wish I could think of this word off the top of my head. There was a, an ad for a Spanish photo storage and sharing site. And it was, you know, it was uh, the ad in Spanish was something like faster, uh, you know, better. And then the third one, it, 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 it translated to more floors. <laughs> and it was like, what? More floors? That's interesting. No. <laughs> but it must have been, it was more storage, I think. It was more like, stores. <laughs> yeah. Storage, you know, like. Uh, oh, okay. Floors. Uh, more space. Floors, I think I'll, I'll, stores, it, more space, probably. Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Sure. But uh, just a fun little, uh, you know, just a little. Basic Spanish for dummies. 99 cents, Windows Phone 7. Yeah. Well, Paul, you seem a little more, uh, you, you seem happier this week than you have been in weeks past. <laughs> really? Why? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe it's that on that update that's coming your way on the Samsung. And maybe that's just that, that happy. Uh, listen, I'm going to download and install an update that does absolutely nothing for me. Right. And, and, could not. ri and could risk bricking your phone. But, you yeah. know, it's it's new. It's fresh. It's shiny. Yeah, yeah, wait. Wait. Shiny. Paul is the editor-in-chief of the Supersite for Windows, winsupersite.com. He's the author of many great books, including Windows Phone Secrets. And uh, you can catch him on this show when we do it every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. <sighs> Eastern at live.twit.tv. Or listen to the download. Because it's on download. iTunes, the Zoom. Download. Are the, kids, are the kids still downloading, The kids Leo? don't know what I'm talking about. How long before what download is, what is this downloading thing? joins Xerox and dialing as a, a verb that makes no so, sense? When when I was a kid, yeah, actually, um, that's I, what I was just about to say is ridiculous because when I was a kid, <laughs> there was no there downloads, no, there were no, no computers. It doesn't no. matter. So I was well when I was younger, we would go to a store like Best Buy and a we would buy a box that had like a disc in it. Or shrink whatever. wrap. There's a word you're not going to hear much anymore. Shrink. Yeah. So wrap. that that obviously that process is stupid. It's going away. Um, downloading though, how interesting would it be if downloading also achieved this status? You know right. that the act of what you downloaded bits to a to a hard hardware that you had in your room with you, and yeah, then you yeah. what do you do? Like you compiled yeah. it or something? We used to have it. terabytes of storage in our house. Yeah, why would you do that? Why would you do that? That's crazy. Someday, no, we are. We're going to make fun of that. That's crazy talk. It is crazy talk. Yeah. Um. However, for now, you may <laughs> download do. it. Yeah. That said, please do. Download please do. It. Please, we beg of you. At uh, iTunes, uh, Zoom Store, everywhere. You know, it's a great show. It's a it's a wonderful show. We are going to be at South by Southwest now. Next weekend, I'll be next week. I'll be here, and then the next okay. day, we're going to head to Austin for the big yeah. South by Southwest. We'll be doing live coverage Saturday and Sunday, and we have a live event 
at Momo's on the 13th, I think that's Sunday, uh, from 1 a.m. to uh, late at night. We'll okay. start with the radio show, then TNT, then Twit at 5 p.m., and a meet-up at 7 p.m. right after Twit, and it should be a lot of fun. So come by if you're in Austin next uh, a week from Sunday um, and, and visit us because we're going to have a blast at Momo's. Cool. And uh, you don't, no need admission, uh, no need a ticket. Just show up. Do get there early. It only holds 500 people, and I'm expecting 501. So one of you is not going to get in. Don't let it be you. Let it be you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you'd like it that way. Then you could say, well, I came, but I couldn't get in. And you know, you get the whining in. Paul, we'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye.